The news now in detail. The Ghana Police Service has arrested Bishop Salifa Mwako and Muha Mwako, parents of the suspect driver, involved in the fatal accident that claimed two lives at East Ligon on Saturday, October 12. They are currently in custody assisting with investigations. According to the Ghana Police Service's investigations have so far established that on October 12, El Rad, driving a Jaguar SUV with one other occupant, rammed into a 4x4 Acura driven by Joseph Aka with four other occupants at Mensa Wood Street at East Ligon. Both cars caught fire, burning beyond recognition. Three of the five victims in the Akura were rescued and the other two identified as Justine Adbenu and Mami Juma, both 12 years, lost their lives. Two of the rescued victims who sustained minor injuries were treated and discharged, while the third is still on admission, receiving medical attention. The suspected driver with the other occupants in the Jaguar are currently on admission at the hospital. Away from that rather unfortunate news, the two sides of Parliament were thrown into spirited arguments for and against the motion filed by Member of Parliament for Tamale South, Harun Idrisu, asking the Speaker of Parliament to declare four seats vacant following the decision of the four MPs to contest the next elections as independent candidates. Now, referencing, referencing Article 97.1 of the Constitution, Harun Idrisu noted that the four MPs have made their intentions not to remain with their political parties on which they came to Parliament. Now, MPs from both sides took turns to articulate why they believe the Speaker should declare the seats vacant or otherwise. Now, let's listen to what some MPs have been saying on the matter. Order 93.1 of the standing orders of this House on a matter of public importance. The Speaker, it has come to our notice that the Honorable Peter Kwache Aka the current NDC member for Amenfi Central in the Western region has filed with the Electoral Commission to your, your party member, your party has no petition. Have you, as General Secretary, written any petition that you've sacked him? And then he's not here. Even if there's a, a letter from the General Secretary that Honorable Aka has been sacked from NDC, he has to be heard. A man must be heard. The rule is that if all men find a man's hand in a tail, his guilt must still be proven. You cannot just get up and say, Mr. Speaker, to make a declaration, declare somebody's seat vacant. And Mr. Speaker, the Harun Idrisu petition, if you look at it, it means that you are supposed to refer the petition to petitions committee. What they are doing, they just want a short circuit. And that is what Honorable Atufosin is trying to do. So Mr. Speaker, a statement is made. First of all, the statement has to be admitted. But because of the urgency of this matter, I don't think I'll even belabor that point. But the 93 it says that the clerk shall make available to members copies of the admitted statement. But because of the urgency of this matter and the seriousness of the matter, I will not also belabor that point. But Mr. Speaker, when you look at order, order 5, uh, 2, they say in the case, in any case not provided by these orders, the Speaker shall decide on the procedural question. Mr. Speaker, as far as Order 93 is concerned, it is clear what will happen to a statement made under Order 93. And we have been in this house for a long time. When you decide to make a statement after people will comment, that's what you are doing. When we finish commenting, if the Speaker thinks that the comments are set as to raise a serious issue, you refer the matter to a committee. The committee will go investigate the matter. And therefore, you cannot pray in aid Article 2 of the Constitution. So why is the factual basis in law for, for, for the Speaker to do what you want him to do? Who would look at the, like the, 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 the facts? The Supreme Court. So if you, you, want, you want the Speaker to give a decision in a vacuum, and somebody, I heard somebody say, when the speaker is informed. The speaker is informed about what? What has happened? What is the information about? It is a pleasure of somebody. Therefore, there's no factual.
places that people have crossed carpet and say that the, the, the speaker should just rubber stamp your so-called information. There should be an evidential basis for the speaker to take that decision. Under, under order 18, as is being urged upon you, what is the evidential support for the speaker to take that decision? On the mere say so of a, a political platform, uh, 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 to thinking, trying to appease those he was hearing, and they said, Oh, I'm going to use the speaker. Oh, my God and King, deliver us. Deliver this. I'm leaving this chamber. This is a very hollow chamber. Meanwhile, Majority Leader Alexander Henyo Marken has announced that he has filed an injunction application of the Supreme Court in response to the minority's attempt to declare the seat of independent candidates vacant. This development follows the announcement by former Minority Leader Haruna Idrisu that his side of the House plans to invoke Article 971G of the Constitution. I got uh, a memo which was addressed to Mr. Speaker by the respected member for Tamale South. Uh, I got a copy, and uh, he has sent a notice of petition to Mr. Speaker to declare some seat vacant, and he has listed Agona West, Suhum, Amenfi Central, and Formina. So he relies on Order 99 and also anchors his application on Order 18, and. Uh, he intends to move the house to uh, consider this uh, matter. But uh, before then, I think um, I have also uh, looked at the matter, the constitutional provision, and I hold the view that the members of my caucus who have filed to go independent for the next election have not written to me as the head of the caucus to say that they are no more part of the caucus. So as far as I'm concerned, the caucus remains intact. And I believe that some of these controversies are better settled by the courts. So in my capacity as the majority leader, I have filed a writ at the Supreme Court. Parliament has been duly served. Well, we've just been informed right now that the Speaker is making a very important statement in the House of Parliament. So we're going to take you live there right now to the Parliament House where Speaker Bagman is currently on the floor. Alban Sumana Kingsford Bagman, but Speaker of Parliament. That office, not me in person. So he's taking that to the Supreme Court. I also listened to the comments on the proper venue. Those of you who commented talking about the High Court and the determination of these matters. They are disagreeing with his procedure of going to the Supreme Court. But the reliefs are quite different. From what he said, what he told me, because I have not been served with the process yet. And so that is still not before me. So please kindly give me these two days, and I will come here with a well-written ruling I will submit it to all of you so that at the end of the day, justice would have not only been done, but would have been seen to be manifestly done in this matter. Yes, please. Speaker, uh, very humbly, I think that it will be fair that I haven't made reference to the suit in my submission and same having been referred to uh, in your comments uh, soon thereafter. Uh, as has been the practice of this house, it is appropriate that same is made available to the, to the table 
office. So, Mr. Speaker, would you leave? Would you leave? It's a document that, Mr. 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 Speaker, majority, majority leader. Mr. Speaker, majority, may I finish, Mr. Speaker? Majority leader. Mr. Speaker, may I finish? May I now, Mr. Speaker, please. Mr. Speaker, these are the gentlemen who are seeking please, justice, please, and are obstructing justice. These are the gentlemen who some minutes ago were talking about justice. See them. See the lawyers among them. Mr. Speaker, I need to make my point, and I will make my point. I will need to make my point, and I will make my point. Mr. Speaker, this practice that when we are up on our feet, they will get up to obstruct must end. This must end. Mr. Speaker, what I am saying is that I refer to my suit in my submission. In your comments, you referred to the very suit that I filed at the Supreme Court. I am saying that as a house, the practice has always been that when you refer to a document, you make the document available to, 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 to the house. Mr. Speaker, I am therefore, I am therefore seeking your leave to enable me make the document available through the table office so that it becomes part of the answer. Mr. Speaker, when I, soon after my submission, Hansa department sent a lady. They came here with this, that they want this suit, and then the petition I read. They referred to the Aaron Idris' petition. This is the notice they brought. It's here. Mr. Speaker, the notice of your petition. We will return to Parliament when the minority leader makes a statement. But earlier, the Speaker of Parliament urged MPs to strike a balance between their legislative duties and the pressures of their election campaigns. In his formal address, he emphasized the importance of staying dedicated to the House, especially as they tackle urgent decisions in the weeks ahead. There's more in this report. The fifth meeting of the fourth session of Parliament commenced at the Dome of the Accra International Conference Centre with Speaker Alban Bagwin emphasising the critical nature of decisions to be made in the sitting. He urged MPs to remain steadfast in their duties of stressing the need for high levels of seriousness. The legislative agenda ahead is weighty and we must approach it with the seriousness it demands. The Speaker went on to highlight key bills that will be considered during this sitting and he charged MPs to ensure that sensitive legislation is given priority. The Environmental Protection Bill, Parliamentary Service Bill and the Parliamentary Transition Bill. We must ensure that bills of time sensitive nature are scheduled for debate and decisions as soon as possible. With election season on the horizon, the Speaker urged them to balance the demands of their campaigns with legislative responsibilities. It is understandable that the demands of campaigning will pull at your time and energy. However, it is critical that we balance these demands with our legislative responsibilities. He advised them to act with decorum to preserve the gains of democracy. Our actions, our ways, and our conduct will be seen and heard by our constituents. We must, therefore, be mindful. Well, in their opening remarks, leaders of both the majority and the minority caucuses talked tough on Galamsey, with two forcing blaming the dire situation and a lack of leadership and possible complicity of government, a position opposed to by the majority leader, Alexander Penyomarking. At the heart of this crisis is leadership failure, official complicit and lack of political will by the Kufuado Baumia government and the MPP. We cannot, as a political class, blame game on Bogalamse and say that a particular political party, in this case, the Kufuado administration has failed in its fight against Galamse and leave out what happened preceding the administration of Akufo Adugala, uh, administration. The minority leader also warned against the reckless spending in the lead-up to the 2024 elections. Government must guard against the temptation of spending 
and it does not have to be only this election. Such reckless fiscal indiscipline is what has landed our dear country into debt hole. For his part, Majority Leader Alexander Pinho Marking urged sector ministers to be present in Parliament to respond to questions from MPs, highlighting the limited time available to address critical issues. Due to the limited time within which this business may be conducted, I would humbly urge all sector ministers again to kindly schedule their programs effectively so that they can make time to appear before this House to respond to questions filed by honourable members. As Parliament resumes, both the majority and the minority leaders have made it clear that the coming weeks will require decisive action, especially on issues like Galamse, amongst others. Noble Crosby Allen, a Crime International Conference Centre. A reminder, you're still watching News 360. This is our major news bulletin for the day. We're streaming live on Facebook. We're also live on your DSTV channel 279. If you feel very strongly about any of our topical stories this hour, feel free to visit any of our social media pages on Facebook and on X. Just kindly post your comments and we promise to share them with the rest of the world. This is your Election Command Center. The Electoral Commission is set to release the certified copies of the voters album to all political parties in the first week of November. The Commission has triggered a four-day re-exhibition of the Provisional Voters Register online to make it fit for the December 7 polls. Meanwhile, some political parties are divided with the mode of the re-exhibition process. Twelve political party representatives and a representative of Movement for Change were present at the second live inter-party advisory committee meeting that discussed the online re-exhibition of the Provisional Voters Register. The Electoral Commission is re-exhibiting the Provisional Voters Register over a four-day period to afford prospective voters a second chance to check their details, this time online. The Commission has also made available the use of USSD code star 711 star 51 hash to enable voters check their names in the provisional album without the use of the internet. Chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Jean Adukwe Mensa, offered some explanations. I think that we've gone out of our way to do this re-exhibition. So we should not act and talk, speak as if the exhibition is being done online. We know very, very well that the exhibition was done in all 40,000 plus polling stations. And the register, physical copies of the register were sent there. So this is not an exhibition. But some political parties present at the Interparty Advisory Committee meeting held different views about the exercise. The People's National Convention, PNC, and the Convention's People's Party, CPP, want the EC to include an in-person avenue where internet access could not be a barrier. But the last time we, make, we came to IPA, we made it very clear that yes, we know that uh, when there are issues of provisional register, there are always errors, which the CEI has stipulated how this error should be corrected. So a re-exhibition for us was in order. But on that same day, we raised a red flag when the commissioner spoke about doing only online re-exhibition. Because some of us felt that, look, what happens to our rural folks? Because already we have low patronage when it comes to exhibition exercises. So for you to say that you are sticking to only online, it means that you further want to reduce the patronage. For the National Democratic Party, NDP, the avenue created by the Electoral Commission must be adhered to by stakeholders. Most often, you know, when even opportunities are, you know, made available, we don't take advantage of them. But you see, whether you like it or not, these obstacles will still remain, you know. But for me, the most important thing is that we must all apply ourselves to the rules. That's all. The National Democratic Congress, NDC, was concerned with the Electoral Commission's online platform. He also insisted that the EC allows political parties to endorse the pink sheets that will be used for this year's elections. We are talking of the statement of poll, which we call pink sheet. We also want to sign off on it. We don't want to be taken by chance, like what happened in 2020. Go and print a different pink sheet, and finally you have to use stamp to stamp on the pink sheet on the election day. We don't want that thing to appear this year. So we want you to come with a pink sheet. We know that we all sit around a table like this, look at the pink sheet, and say, this is the pink sheet we are going to use for this 2024 election. And we all sign onto it before it gets to the printing house. The Electoral Commission responded. We do not have any hesitation at all in having you sign the ballots 
and the pink sheets because you've just, as you mentioned, you were there last week to sign the notice of poll. So there's really no difference and there's, there's no cause for alarm here. The commission also granted the NDC's request for political parties to endorse the pink sheets that will be used for this year's elections, but denying them a request to assess the commission's API to enable them to do mass checking of prospective voters' details. The NDC vice presidential candidate, Professor Nana Jinopokwa Jaman, has asked voters to reject politicians who offer them money to be voted for. She was speaking to supporters in the Bono region at the start of her campaign tour there. The Bono region has 12 constituencies. Of the 12 constituencies, the NDP has six parliamentary seats and the NDC also has six parliamentary seats. The NDC previously in 2016 had just one parliamentary seat and the NDP had 11. That obviously is a reason the NDC will want to take its chances and Professor Jena and Professor Jema has been warmly received here. The NDP has been warmly received here. Uko Jomwa, a Jom, a Maya office, Kessie, and I. A two person who are buyer or boo and ma. No, be some who say, A bad man or ba or yeja. A bad man or boy yeja. A son, a two. Who chubby be a wish and no be some say, Ah. It is sad that you'll be a man, Jomay Stan, so to it. Some are men or post for any man, a dear no lady. As I say, he are buying. And I see a chain, a banner chain, a basic side in the school. And then I see a ticket jetty and nominate the Akora Eba. A year, a Jumabi and Yamia, a Jumana Eba, and see a two as one Kakran Kakra. A day on all tongue, if I saw him, you own ya, and I face a Siobuno, lay the association. Oh, now you can say, if you are messed up in me at my office, and so on that way. Me ya boko boko na mi kuriya mo office enu ano no. Biti biya me juma ana me boa. Yesi anya shwe wo di yesi office no. If you say a house shwe a house chiri timi ba. Na wo si office shwe ya shwe e go e mi mi ne. In other news tonight, President Akufado has urged the NDC presidential candidate, John Dramani Mahama, to debate Vice President Dr. Baumia if he feels the NDC is the best option for Ghana. Speaking at the Jakba Palace in Damongo, President Akufado said the Ghanaian people deserve to hear from the two leading candidates, debate about national issues and bring with it their solutions. Someone who wants to be president, he can't change his mouth. One side of his mouth is saying one thing, the other side of his mouth is saying another. It is not good for him. In the 2020 elections, after the government had acted on the Galamse, he went around all the mining districts of Ghana to tell them that when he comes, he's going to give amnesty to anybody who has been attacked by, on the Galamse issue by my government. So it's not surprising that MPP lost in all those constituency that when he comes he will now enforce the Galamse laws we want the NDC four-time NDC presidential candidate to come clean to tell us where does he stand this is what I meant when I said that I was prepared to put my presidency on the line I was prepared to take the political risk in dealing with them Galamse in more news tonight, persons suffering depression, bipolar, anxiety and schizophrenia disorders to access treatment services for free at any NHIS accredited health facility across the country. This is because government has added the treatment of these four mental health disorders onto the NHIS benefits packages. The Chief Executive Officer of the Authority, Dr. Dacosta Bwaji, says the addition is to improve access to mental health care. He spoke exclusively to tv 3 Sarah Apenko. Well, what the authority is trying to do is to creates the environment for all Ghanaians to be able to assess these services at the various hospitals. So it's an opportunity for every Ghanaian to be assessed on these four. Make no mistake, like I said, mental health is not at the end stage. A lot of people are going through depression. A lot of people are going through anxiety issues. And it is time for us to deal with it. In fact, some of these things also lead to even suicide. 
apart from the specialized psychiatric hospitals, all facilities can obviously provide the services. And again, this is also tackling uh, what we call stigma. Because you see, previously, if you ask people to go to any of the psychiatric hospital, because of the stigma attack, they are not able to. And normally we refer to mental health as the last stage disease. But no, a lot of young people are suffering from depression. And this is their time. This is the opportunity to take advantage and visit any health facility from 1st of November of their choice to assess. So when you, are, you also go to a hospital, and um, depending on what you present, you'll be assessed on these four. And the facilities can claim anxiety. Yeah, common ones. A lot of people go through anxiety, bipolar disorders. So I, I, I think um, the experts have actually strategically selected this to benefit the whole of Ga the Ghanaian population. Committed in, uh, on time. Uh, Deeper Life Bible Church has resumed its annual National Campus Community Congress after a five-year break occasioned by COVID-19. At a media launch in Kwasi, coordinator for the Deeper Life Bible Church, Pastor Francis Fosu, said this year's National Campus Congress will be used to raise a new generation of leaders of high moral standing. The annual National Campus Community Congress is an annual event held since the 1970s. But it was truncated in 2019 following the COVID-19 outbreak. Beginning Thursday, October 17, thousands of students from the various tertiary institutions are expected to converge at Brofwe Drew Camp Grounds for this year's Congress. The event ends on Sunday, October 20. At the media launch in Kumase, the National Campus Coordinator of the Church, Pastor Francis Fosu, said the National Campus Community Congress is to raise a new generation. Congress will then be a platform to raise a new generation for our country and also beyond. The rector of the Alpha University College, Professor Joseph Sarkodie Addo, noted with concern that university campuses have fast changed from being the avenue for holistic and quality human resource development to centers where some students learn immoralities and social deviance. He therefore expressed support for the Deeper Life Bible National Campus Community Congress. Campus life is a kind of changing. If you compare the campus life today to when you were in the university, you see that things have changed. Many of the students are there just uh, for being there sick, not academically kind of uh, pursue that they are there. The minister in charge of the Kumasi South District of Deeper Life Bible Church, Pastor Yao Osewusu, noted that with Ghana's population dominated by the youth, training them with the high moral standards and godliness will guarantee problem-solving leaders for the country. We need men of truth, women of truth to govern our nation. And if we can make them, give them the faster to make them to become men and women that we can depend upon, this, our country, will never remain the same. Remind us to watch News 360. We'll go for a short break. Still ahead of the bulletin, we've got the very latest in the world of business. All right, welcome to the business news segment here on News 360. The Civil Society Organization's Alliance is urging government to review the Minerals Income Investment Fund Act, that's MEF, citing concerns over insufficient citizen oversight. Now co-chair of the Ghana Extractive Industry Transparency Initiative, Dr. Steve Mantiao argues that the act does not adequately involve the public in the management of mining revenues, raising questions about transparency and accountability. Now speaking of the second MEF stakeholder forum organized in Accra, he made a case for a review of the act to depict that of the Petroleum Revenue Management Act. I consider that there is a need to revisit the act itself because it has some gaps. If you look at the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, which is being touted as a best practice in the whole of Africa, and again, one of the best in the world, 
you see that it was subjected to intensive public consultations. Certain elements that you find in the Petroleum Revenue Management Act are not present in the Minerals Income Investment Fund Act. An example is the establishment of the Citizens-Led Oversight Committee um, in the oil sector, that is in the, in the name of the Public Interest and Accountability Committee. You do not find that in the Minerals Income Investment Act arrangements, and therefore citizens do not get timely and regular information about MIF and how our mineral revenues are being used. In other news tonight, private legal practitioner David Ofosudorte has called for a more strategic use of Ghana's mineral resources to boost industrialization. Now, speaking of the second Minerals Income Investment Fund stakeholder forum in Accra, he highlighted the missed opportunity in adding value to local iron ore and manganese deposits, which could help the country advance its industrial goals. At the second Mineral Income Investment Fund stakeholder forum, David Ofosudote stressed the importance of utilizing Ghana's abundant mineral resources to drive wealth creation and industrialization. He raised concerns that, despite having significant deposits, the country still imports iron ore from a war-torn country like Ukraine. The last time I checked, we were importing iron ores from Ukraine. And it's one of the reasons why the Ukraine war affected the prices of uh, iron ores. And for a country which has manganese and the combination of iron ore and manganese and this input into value addition, and we are unable to actually add value to both, is quite concerning. For his part, Deputy Minister of Lands and Natural Resources, Mirekuduka, has charged the Minerals Income and Investment Fund to complement efforts at tracking mineral resources and clamp down on gold smuggling. Help develop a more advanced framework to track production along the mining value chain to reconcile appropriate mineral rent due the state. Further collaborate with the ministries of lands and natural resources, finance, national security to develop a robust system to track gold smuggling and illicit financing of mineral projects. Meanwhile, Chief Executive of MIF, Edward Corantin, has expressed his outfit's commitment to realizing about $6 billion in royalties in the next 10 years. We are looking at um, moving our assets and our management from about $1.5 billion now, following a re-evaluation of our assets, including government of Ghana's carried interest, to about $6 billion within 10 years. How we are going to do that is first how we expand the royalties net. We are using technology to expand the royalties net. That's it for the very latest in the world of business. For more business news stories, do also visit our website. It's www.3news.com. Thank you so much, Pa. Let's now continue with the rest of our stories. And the peaceful town of Budumburum was shattered in seconds as a routine rock blast turned into a nightmare. Rocks fell from the sky like hailstones, leaving a trail of destruction and heartbreak. Three lives were lost instantly and many more injured. Godwin Asidiba has more. Pieces of rock rain down like death from the skies, killing three instantly in Budumburam after a rock blast. This rock here, I will be calling in the story the cursed rock. It fell on the head of one Thomas Kofi in Budumbram, splashed his head, and blood was oozing profusely, according to residents here. This heap of sand has been used to cover his blood stains. You come to this part as well, and you see that the blood stains are very much visible here as well. We have been told by the eyewitnesses that this metal fence was as even as this before. The rock forcefully penetrated through this angle from the skies after the blast situation happened along the Budum Bramwane bus stretch. This has thrown most of the residents here in Big Apple down in arms. Georgina Bamfo was helpless. Her hands were drenched in her father's blood. She had just watched him slip away in her arms, calling desperately to neighbors for help. The daughter of Thomas Kofi, she could not do anything but scream in agony as her father 
took his last breath. Yeah, yeah, this is a dinner at the HQ dining in Assassinoba. To be for a meme realizes a yen swelling janino. Men no me who nensa at that short moment in Nensa to name who say good missy. Na na me chino, but me 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 gane ko dine china me sa me chiba no. Na or share table ni fin fin ya moja e nyun. A seven month old baby, too young to comprehend the disaster, has been crying since the explosion. Seven months old baby Bianca has not been spared from the incident that happened yesterday. According to her mother, some pieces of rock fell on her right leg and also on her head as well. She has been crying since I got here and she's been transferred from the St. Gregory Hospital to another facility for an x-ray to be conducted to know exactly what has happened to her right leg. Do watch out for the full story in our subsequent bulletins. We have sport news coming up shortly. Hello, good evening, and welcome to the sports segment here on News 360 with me, Ori Kuampofo. The Black Stars still have just two points from a possible 12 after suffering a 2 0 defeat against Sudan and Libya earlier on Tuesday, casting a lot of doubt on their chances of reaching the next AFCON. My colleague, Billy Shen, has more details. The last time Ghana failed to qualify for an AFCON was in 2004 and 20 years later it's looking more and more likely after a 2 0 defeat against Sudan. It was a showing of poor defending as Sudan capitalized in the second half to get that victory to move them ever closer to qualifying for the AFCON after missing out on the 2023 edition. Now, Currently, Angola have secured qualification to the tournament and Sudan now need just one point out of the rest of the two games they have to play to secure qualification. For Ghana, they have to win both matches and hope that Sudan falter right at the end so that they can make it to Morocco. According to the former head coach of the Black Star, CK Akono, he believes that the team has been playing with an individual sense instead of a team sense in the recent games that they've played. I, I think if you, after these first two matches, that was impressive. Uh, we've always known that the team has not been um, uh, a situation where they are playing like a team. You know, it's more of individual uh, brilliance uh, that if uh, a lot of people have shown what they can do. But as the team collectively, we've not been able to see exactly what, what is expected of them. And it's simply difficult, difficult also because the time factor. They come here for a week or whatever and then they go back. So it's, it's, it's a very uh, difficult situation for any other coach. And so uh, they've not shown the uh, ability to work as a team. And, and that is what, what we lack. It's, 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 been, it's, been, it's been there. But also, we must understand that they are in a, a, period, a period of challenges. They are in a challenging moment for, for them. And um, they need to get it quickly, else uh, it, it will not be too good. So it's basically been a trajectory that has shown a fall for Ghanaians. In AFCON 2019, they fell off at the round of 16. 2021 fell off at the group stage. 2023 fell off at the group stage. And it looks likely that in 2025, Ghana will not make it to the competition at all, which would be a really dark period for Ghana football as a whole. We'll see what happens in November, but it's not looking really, really good for Ghana. Was well, definitely not looking good for Ghana, but especially following that poor performance uh, from the Black Stars. Now, fans at Circle, that's the hub of business here in Accra, also shared their dissatisfaction after the game. Why Ghana? Eh, Ghana, we should go and beg a player to come and play for our national team. Why should we do so? Why we have talent here? I mean, why a, a defender who cannot play a ball with a player on the touchline? Look at our second goal. Just look at it. You are, you are playing a football. You want to select players. Conference League, they scored this to a goalkeeper. Six goals to nil. Six goals to nothing. It's the first keeper in your the national team. The Saga could say, you bring to Wado. What is the achievement of Wado? I think the Ghana team, the Ghana team must be dissolved. They have, to, they have to dissolve the whole team. And reshuffle all the players. Because what, what is going on there? We shouldn't go at all because looking at our performance through the qualifiers, we didn't do well. And then heading to the main tournament, 
I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But we we'll just hope. We we'll just hope they do something. She could do. We saw twenty days fine. What people could do ten days? I could find Captain Ban. Oh my! This is the place. Oh, and yes, Captain Ban. Then I was born. No, no. Musu abidi atiro. But over here, Nipa now. Oh yeah, Captain now. Oh, I bet you free. Nipa say no. Nipa yeah. Oh, but yeah. Any move, but move. Oh, so yeah. Tell me. Sandy, I remember calling you. I got now. So qualified. African boy, I'm going to qualify. And then uh, he wear the necklace. The Yankan wore the Oh, Yankan, Yankan, Yankan. And how, how, how? They say, say, Ghana, Ghana football. Now, see a giant near the top of the farm. Well, it looks like it's very difficult for a number of fans uh, to take uh, with the Ghasti Ghana's recent performances. Uh, but you can get some more reactions on our social media handles at Three Sports GH on Twitter, Facebook, and then Instagram. My name is Ori Kwampofo, and up next on the bulletin is entertainment. Welcome to the entertainment news segment. My name is Anita Ikia Ikufu, and there was something for everyone at the cinema this year, from mind-blowing fantasy films to animations and steamy dramas, all fronted by Hollywood heavyweights. With just 2025 around the corner, we look back on what the film world had to offer. As the curtains rose on 2024, Hollywood's biggest names pledged an unforgettable year of cinematic brilliance, and they have certainly delivered. Disney kicked off the year with a splash release in the much anticipated Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 in May. The Marvel blockbuster scored past $1 billion in global ticket sales, setting an impressive tone for Disney's lineup. Following the success, the studio unveiled the prequel Mufasa the Lion King, which captivated audiences with its stunning visuals and had felt storytelling the circle is broken there will be one lion king Warner Bros. also showcased its DC Extended Universe, DCEU Heavyweights. The Flash zoomed into theaters in June, followed closely by Aquaman 2 in December. Both films exceeded expectations, further solidifying the DCEU status in the superhero genre. The key to this prison is the royal bloodline itself. He needs us. We're the end of the bloodline. Universal Pictures revived classic horror with the launch of Universal Monsters, beginning with Dracula in October. The film's success has set the stage for future monster crossovers. Meanwhile, Netflix continued to assert its dominance in award season with the critically acclaimed films like The Color Purple and Killers of the Flower Moon, reinforcing its position as a key player in Hollywood. With just two months left in 2024, major studios are already eyeing 2025, gearing up to push the boundaries of storytelling and entertainment even further. Here are some of the most anticipated upcoming releases poised to dominate the box office. I trusted them, and now this is the end of all of us. Zootopia 2 is set to enchant audiences in the US on November 26, 2025. Avatar. Fire and Ash. Following the expansive vision of its predecessor, this sequel is set to hit theaters on December 19, 2025. Now You See Me 3. The third installment is the magic themed franchise starring Jesse Einsberg is scheduled for a wide release on November 14, 2025. As the cinematic landscape evolves, fans eagerly await what 2025 will bring. That's it for the entertainment news segment. My name is Anita Ikea. Ikea, Ikea have a good evening. And that's it for News 360. Thank you so much for spending one hour of your time with us. I am Paul Shia Gabo. And my name is Parker Siasari.